Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to our latest iteration of our continuing online educational series. Today we will be discussing the use of unbiased stereology to accurately determine the number of cells in a region of interest. My name is Jose Maldonado and with me today is staff scientist Dr. Dan Peruzzi. Hi, this is Dan. Hello everyone. At this time you might want to use uh, this opportunity to adjust the volume of your speakers so that you can hear us at a comfortable listening volume. Over the course of the following 60 minutes, we will be discussing the optical fractionator and the theory behind it. We'll be discussing what it is and why you'd want to use it, some guidelines for its use, specifically focusing on avoiding bias and evaluating precision. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So Dan, uh, I, I have a situation that I, well, maybe you can help me with. Um, I've got a population of transgenic mice and I've managed to affect uh, what I believe is a change in the cell numbers of their striatum. Uh, I have several lines of evidence indicating that there is a difference in cell numbers between my controls and my experimental groups, but what I would really like to do is to have a quantification of the numbers of cells in this region to be able to actually give some kind of estimate uh, as to the differences in cells. What I do know is that I'm going to be using stereology and I know that I'm going to be using the optical fractionator, but I don't really know much about the considerations that I need to take into account as I prepare my study and I get started. Uh, can you help me out? Yes, uh, yeah, let's talk about this problem and I, I just want to say that you're, you're way ahead of the game right now because You've already thought about your experimental problem. Uh, you've designed your hypothesis or your question or what you think is happening. You've designed an experiment. You know what question you want to ask. And you've done the best thing you can do, which is kind of boil the question down to what kind of data are you looking to get. Yeah. And you've mentioned to me that you're looking to see if the numbers of cells have changed. Yeah. And so that's kind of an easy question to ask. Um, you know, if it was on the gross level and we were looking at one pile of rocks and another pile of rocks. Mm -hmm. We could just count them and see what is the number there. Yeah. Of course, the problems that arise for us is this is brain tissue, mm -hmm. um, and we have to section it, yeah. and we have to put it up on a microscope and look at it. Yeah. And when you section through the tissue, you're going to destroy cells. When you look at cells uh, under the microscope, uh, you're going to tend to be looking at pieces of cells, and a lot of people think about counting pieces of cells or cell profiles yeah. uh, wh when they're um, facing this problem of uh, my control versus my experimental animals, has the number of cells changed? Right, so that's kind of what I was thinking was just making uh, tissue sections and then looking at the, taking a picture of the section and just looking at the section and just counting every time that I see the outline or the profile of a cell. And this is what a lot of people attempt to do. They'll try to look at the top of their physical sections and count the number of cell pieces so that we can think about this problem. Um, uh, I've prepared a uh, kind of an idealized volume. It's a cube, mm -hmm. and um, yeah. So let's look at that here. These these uh, movies were made in our program Stereo Investigator, and this mm -hmm. is from an image stack. Mm -hmm. So there's many images going down the z-axis, mm -hmm. and there's so few cells here we can actually count them as it rotates. And I've done this. So notice there's particles in three dimension, yeah. and we want to know the number of these particles. And I've already counted them. There's 39 particles in here. Okay. These particles are all different sizes and shapes. Yeah. And what many people will attempt to do is to section the tissue. Mm -hmm. And what I'm going to do is take this idealized volume and section it into four physical sections. And that's what these red planes represent. Okay, so everywhere that I see a red plane here, you're saying you're going to take this volume and pretend that these red planes are where your cryostat or your vibratome or something else has so cut. So we can see from that side view we have four sections. Yeah. And we can... We can kind of mimic as if we had cut this block of tissue into four pieces. Mm -hmm. And then what we're going to do is take a look at the top of all of the four sections. Okay, and the four sections you mean the, the slice generated from the top to the first red plane and uh, so forth from there down. Right, and notice we've changed the view here so we're not seeing the whole particles, we're just seeing a slice through the z-axis of the particle. Right. So we're kind of focusing up and down through the z axis and what we're going to do is pretend like we have four physical sections here and look at the top of each section. Okay. So that's the top of the first section. Yeah. Okay. And then we focus put the second section on the microscope and we look at how many cell pieces 
are at the top of the second section. Yeah. Now we're looking at how many cell pieces are at the top of the next section. Mm -hmm. And so we're trying to mimic what you would do, which is... Look at cell profiles at the top of the section where I... At the top it. of each physical section. Right. So that's what we've done, and here's four photomicrographs. These show that as we focused on the top of four sections that we made in the z-axis, we counted 23 cell pieces. Okay, and you already said you knew ahead of time by, by counting this that there were 39 actually in there. There are actually 39 particles in this idealized volume that we're using to talk about these concepts. Mm -hmm. So the first point is it's wrong to think that the number of cell pieces is going to actually equal the number of cells. And yeah. I think most people realize this. Yeah. So there's no direct one-to-one -one relationship between whenever I see a cell profile and the cell being there. That's right. Um, so if that's not true, that doesn't equal, so then what is the relationship uh, between a cell profile and a cell? There's none? Um, it's, there is a relationship. It's not a simple relationship. The size of the cell will affect how many cell pieces or how many cell profiles you get, the orientation of the cell. The orientation of the tissue. So um, you're saying this estimate, if I'm counting cell profiles, my cell number estimate can be affected even by the angle at which I decide to section my tissue in. Right, so not only does the number of cell pieces not equal the number of cells, but if we... Uh, section this idealized volume through a different plane. Okay. So last time we pretended like we had four physical sections down the Z plane. Mm -hmm. And so now you're going to do this... Um, okay, so, so here this, we're... This is what we did last time. Okay. We looked at the top of four sections. <clears throat> yeah. We pretended like we had four physical sections. Now I'd like to change that 90 degrees and we'll flip this idealized volume around so you mm -hmm. can see that now we are pretending like we're cutting through this volume perpendicular to the way we just cut it, Okay. <clears throat> but still to come out with four sections. So the sections that you're going to cut here are going to be at the same interval as you did in the z-axis, right? That's right. The only difference is now we are sectioning them down the y-axis. And so we do the same thing. We take a look at the top of all four sections, yeah. and we count how many cell pieces or cell profiles that we get total. Mm -hmm. And so let's see. Um, and, and these are photomicrographs of what we saw there. Okay, okay. So and you got 17 cells this time. Right. So when we sectioned down the z-axis and made four physical sections and counted the number of cell pieces at the top of each section, mm -hmm. we had 23 pieces. Yeah. Now we've done that uh, along another axis, 90 yeah. degrees, yeah. and we're coming out with a different number of cell pieces. Right. So you originally counted that there were 39 cells in this volume, and you got 23 when you counted cell profiles in the z-axis, and you got 17 when you counted cell profiles in the y-axis. So... 17 is not 39. That's right, and 17 is not 23. <laughs> right. And what, what many people will will ask us about is, well, isn't that why we have an experimental and a control Right, program? so that's what I was going to just ask you is, okay, fine, even if I was um, getting this value, okay, so I know I'm not getting 39, I'm getting 23 or 17, but if I just section my tissue of both my controls and my transgenic mice, in, in Z in both of them, or in Y in both of them, don't, doesn't this kind of bias just cancel itself out? You're hoping that the bias will vary non-systematically, but how can you prove something like that? I don't know. And rather than trying to go and prove that the number of cell pieces you get is the same from control right. versus experiment, or even within a group, wouldn't it be much better if we could count cells? Yeah, I, my task is not here to, to prove a, a a methodology. I, I want to yeah. count cells and, and quantify It's much better to count cells than to count cell pieces. So and how do I go around this? How do, what do I do? With the optical fractionator probe, yeah. what you want to do is not count the cell profiles, mm -hmm. but instead pick a unique point on the particle, on okay. the cell. And this should be a point that comes into focus in the z-axis and then goes out of focus. Okay. Um, in other words, if you're counting humans, you would pick maybe their heads, because every human has one head. So, so I would pick one uniquely identifiable part of the cell, whether it's the top of the cell or the top of the nucleus, or maybe the, the maximum diameter of the nucleolus. And then instead of counting every time that I see a cell profile, I would only count a cell if the top of the cell or the top of the nucleus is actually in focus. That's right. And when you mention nucleolus, um, you can only use the nucleolus if there's 
one and only one. Okay. You don't want to give yourself a choice about where this point is. Okay. We want to have an unambiguous <coughs> handle on the cell. Okay, so if this works, then you should be able to get the same number. You should be able to get 39 uh, no matter what axis you section your, your tissue and optically here. And correct? so that's what I did. Rather than pretending like I'm sessioning that cube with the 39 particles in it up yeah. into four sections, uh -huh. instead, I focused through, uh, through the z-axis, mm -hmm. and every place where I saw a cell top, I put a red dot. Okay, so fundamentally what you did differently here is instead of just picking four locations in this volume, you're now focusing up and down at a much finer resolution identifying where the top of a cell is that's and right placing a marker and look at this cell that kind of catches your eye in the middle here yeah that large one yeah there it is um, so this is how this is done you focus up and down you see that that's a cell yeah you look for the top of the cell so that cell and you have to focus up to a plane where the top is not there and when the top is there to unambiguously identify the top yes and then you put a red mark on it and so I noticed that that cell showed up uh, at various optic planes. Um, you didn't count it every time it showed up on an optic plane. You only counted it when it showed up at, as the cell top. That's right. Okay. There's only one cell top. You put one marker on that. Now we're counting cells instead of counting cell pieces. And look what happens when we step through perpendicular to this. Okay. Um, even though we're coming at these particles on what was their side, yeah. Uh, for the last uh, focusing that we did, we're going to be focusing up and down through the x-axis this time mm -hmm. rather than the z-axis, but every cell still only has one top. Okay, again, picking an unambiguous location of the cell and only counting when that shows up. And so by counting cells, by picking a point on the cell and only counting that, and, and there you can see I marked a yellow yeah, yeah. Uh, the one on the left, circle I see that. on the cell top. Now we come out with 39 cells. Okay, we don't so have to worry about counting cell pieces. We don't have to worry about the orientation that we're uh, approaching these particles from. Okay, so to kind of summarize what we've gotten so far here, um, you've, kind of, you've shown me empirically here that if I count cell profiles, uh, I am introducing a bias that I, I can't really account for. I really don't know. And that, that sort of variation of cell number, I know you showed me there were 39, you got like 23 on one and 17 on another just by flipping the axis of the tissue. There's actually been formulas that have been made up to try to convert number of cell pieces to number of cells. Mm -hmm. One prominent one is the Abercrombie formula. I yeah. remember when JCN started insisting that people use that, mm -hmm. but now we're past that and we can count cells instead of counting cell pieces. So to, to kind of summarize, um, in order to actually count cells, you want to pick one part of the cell, like its cell top or the nucleus top, and just count that one only. That's right. And an offshoot of that is you're not going to be able to tell where a cell top is in a two-dimensional system. Okay. So, um, In other words, you need at least two focal planes to see that the cell top was not there and is there. Right. So that's what you demonstrated when you had only four sections. With mm -hmm. only those four sections, mm -hmm. we couldn't actually determine if that was just one part of the cell or many. You have to be able to focus up and down through it continuously, very finely, to identify just that cell top. That's yes. right. So, Dan, the next problem that I have is... I don't have 39 cells in the striatum. I have a lot more than 39, okay. and I can't possibly count them all. Okay, so we've seen one rule is to pick a point on the cell and use that point uh, to count the cells. Mm -hmm. But, as you said, there's more than 39 cells. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to need to do is figure out a way to sample. Okay. Uh, so we want to be able to restrict where we are sampling. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're referring to as a volume fraction, right? We're going to be sampling a percentage of the volume that we're interested in knowing how many particles are there. And that can be called the volume fraction. Okay, so how do we actually create one? And after we sample in the volume fraction, what we'll do is we'll extrapolate to get the estimate. Okay. Uh, to create a volume fraction, you have to use this specialized virtual space. It's called the dissector. Mm -hmm. You notice it's spelled wrong on purpose <laughs> with one S. I noticed we're that. Coining a new word. I see. And uh, the dissector is a cube or a three-dimensional rectangle, and that is where you're going to restrict yourself to deciding whether the top of the cell or the top of the nucleus or the nucleolus, if there's only one, mm -hmm. one and only one nucleolus, and from now on I'm just going to say cell top. Okay. We're going to restrict ourselves to counting only in this dissector. We're going to put it down in such a way that we know the volume fraction, mm -hmm. and then we're going to extrapolate. Okay, so the dissector here is a, is a three-dimensional 
quadrilateral that sits in the virtual space of the tissue Z space. And if I'm picking nucleolus tops, I'll only count nucleolus tops if they appear in the volume of that dissector. That's right. And, and that is a three-dimensional virtual space. And I noticed there's, uh, there's a difference in the colors there. Yeah. Um, there are, are green and red lines. And what we're looking at here is a cross-section through that dissector. So the dissector in two dimensions is what we call the counting frame. That's right. Um, so as you focus through this three-dimensional virtual space called the dissector, you'll encounter the cross-section through it, which is called the counting frame. Okay, and so tell me about these rules here. How do I follow these? Okay, first of all, remember what we're counting. Yes, we're counting cell tops. Not cell pieces, cell no. tops. Right. Um, the cell gets counted if the cell top is in the dissector. Okay. And if the cell top is going through a green line, but not a red line. Okay. So let's see some examples of that. Okay. Let's, let's say you decided on the size of your dissector and the... Um, um, automatic stage brings you to the first XY location and you focus down and you see some cell tops. Yeah. Uh, for that one in the middle is how you hope they all come out because right. it's unambiguous. Clearly the, in the middle of the if dissector. If the cell top is in the dissector, the cell gets counted. Yeah. On the left, there's an example of a cell top that's more in the dissector than out of the dissector, mm -hmm. but it goes through the red line, so it does not get counted. So again, if it touches the red line at all, it doesn't get counted. And the red line trumps the green line. So that's one thing that's confused me here because I noticed that crescent-shaped cell that you have here. It's not a crescent-shaped cell. Sorry. It's a crescent-shaped cell top. Correct. The crescent-shaped cell top. It touches the green and the red. It seems to me like here, by not counting the cell, I'm undersampling it. I mean, it's, it's partially in my dissector. It touches the green line. Why am I ignoring this cell here? So you're worried that that might belong in that virtual space and therefore get extrapolated and yeah. that will be undercounting. Yeah. Well, um... We can illustrate what's going on by taking another dissector, uh, really a counting frame, and mm -hmm. putting it right next to this dissector. Okay. And notice that that crescent-shaped cell top that did not get counted for the first dissector we looked at um, is getting counted for this counting frame. I see. Okay, and it's I, I've read somewhere the red lines, you have to consider them as extending out to infinity. That's right. So in this case, that second dissector that's now below that first dissector there is no red line extending out. And so that rule of excluding a cell if it touches the red line doesn't apply to that cell top here in this dissector. That's right, it's very simple. We just look at that second counting frame and we notice that the cell top is going through a green line and mm -hmm. not a red line, so it gets counted. If we put another dissector, another counting frame down, that I cell see. top better not get counted. Okay. So what we're doing is we're taking a lot of pain here to make sure when we count cell tops, we only count the ones that according to our rules that we're going to stick with mm -hmm. belong in that dissector. Yeah, and in this example, I mean, you've put counting frames right next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, more likely than not, if my cells are, are densely packed together, these dissectors will be kind of away from each other, right? But the rules apply over the long run of it, doing it, this. It doesn't so much matter if they're densely packed together. What matters is, is if they're spread out evenly. And I see. These, this cartoon shows the cells spread out quite evenly. Okay. And we would probably never need to put our dissectors this close together to get the precision that we need. Uh -huh. But what we're talking about right now is following the rules to eliminate bias. Okay, so these rules that we talked about are for bias elimination. So before we go ahead and talk about how much to sample, mm -hmm. let's continue talking about rules to follow so we make sure we don't undercount or overcount cells. Okay. Uh, one thing that, that's noteworthy that somebody actually just asked us is, is how do we determine a cell top from a cell itself. And this really becomes a question of, of optics in microscopy, right? And uh, for this purpose, for the purposes of unambiguously identifying a cell top versus some other part of the cell, it really depends on the numerical aperture of your objective lens here. That's correct? right. And the higher, uh, the higher magnification objectives will, will be able to have high numerical apertures. Yeah. Uh, high numerical apertures, for instance, uh, in the, here we have a times 10 with a low numerical aperture on the left. Yeah. And that will not have a high Z resolution. And uh, so the way we interpret that there is that with that low numerical aperture, if you snap a picture of that, you'll get that top small sphere, that middle large sphere, and the bottom small sphere in one picture. You won't be able to tell there's three particles because there. Because I can't focus through that. That's all in one focal point. Everything looks in focus. And this is what most people listening have, have seen when they're at low power. They don't need to focus. Right. When I go to 10x, everything just looks to be in Or 2.5x, everything just appears to be in focus. Because there's a wide swath of what's in focus at Z. Where if you look at that um, great 
objective on the right, 100 times, I think it's 1.4 numerical aperture, it has a much thinner Z plane, mm -hmm. so you can focus up and down. Right. You can, number one, see where one cell ends and the other begins. Mm -hmm. we, can f we can optically shave off a small top, yeah. because the more we can dwindle these particles down to points, uh, the better off we are. So with that objective, I can focus up and down and uniquely focus on the top of that large sphere, the small spheres will be completely out of focus. And even, you know, on the same lines, the rest of that large sphere will be out of focus. So I can independently say, look, I am now in focus on the top of my cell or my nucleus. It's inside of my dissector volume. I will count this as a cell. You're right. You can see there's three particles. You can find their tops. And, and a main point is you really want several focal planes through your dissector, like maybe 10. Mm -hmm. Theoretically, you could do it with two, but it's going to be very hard to focus up and down. First of all, determine, is this my cell type? Yeah. And then number two, find the cell top. So we, we're going to need to use relatively thick tissue. Yes. And a objective with a numerical aperture that will give us thin enough Z planes so we can make good decisions about whether the top of the cell is in the dissector or I not. I see. So you've given me a lot of information here. Let me just kind of summarize this. Uh, in order to, so the optical dissector, uh, the, the optical fractionator rules, I would have to honor the red and green exclusion planes. That's to make sure we're counting only what belongs in those dissectors. And only count cell tops, which would require a high numerical aperture objective. Because we've seen it's no good counting cell pieces. No, you showed me that in, yeah. that in, in uh, axes. Simply the way we section the tissue can affect this. So Dan, one of the questions we get a lot is, is there such a thing as an ideal section thickness for your tissue? There's a range of ideal thicknesses. Mm -hmm. You can't have it too thin where you don't have enough optical planes right, so if my to make tissue, your decision. Sure, so if my uh, 1.4 numerical aperture objective gives me a focal plane of 0.6 microns and my tissue is only 2 microns thick, I will have very few focal planes to go through that, correct? So that would be too thin. And then um, if I section my tissue so thick that I don't have antibody penetration to the middle of it, I can't really perform the analysis. And that's usually what is holding a lot of labs back. They're in a struggle to um, have thin enough tissue so their stains or antibodies can get in, but mm -hmm. thick enough so they can have enough focal planes through their dissector. And so this is something that I think a lot of labs have to kind of empirically figure out with some guidelines, but really you have to just get your tissue uh, to a, a, in, in a preparation that is suitable for this kind of work to give you a suitable number of focal planes to identify cell tops versus cell bodies, but not so thick that I can't actually stain them to identify them. Yeah, there's factors like you're going to be bringing those sections maybe through ascending alcohols, mm -hmm. uh, concentrations that will suck a lot of water out, yeah. and you're just going to have to empirically see how much it shrinks down to. Okay, let's move on now to this other topic that you mentioned to me earlier on, which was systematic random sampling. Uh, my understanding is that systematic random sampling, or SRS, is a methodology for placing the dissector in your tissue without bias. Well, I did mention sampling. I'm not sure if I mentioned systematic random sampling, but this is going to be the best way to actually put those dissectors down, put those virtual spaces where, re where we are restricting ourselves to counting in. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to put those dissectors down in a random and systematic way. Okay. That means there'll be equal spacing between the dissectors, but for each section you come to, um, the dissectors will be thrown down with a new starting point. What do you, I don't, can you uh, explain and that? that? That's also true of the way we pick uh, which sections, which physical sections we're going to take. So systematic random sampling is something that applies both to tissue sections across my region of interest and to the placement of the dissectors on each one of those once sections. You get, once you get the section that you're going to be sampling on, right? Okay, and the systematic random sampling is con consists of three parts, right? There's, it's calculated based on three parts. It's done by three parts. Well, um, y you can know what percentage of the volume you are estimating, what the volume fraction is, by taking the product, by multiplying these three things uh, by each other. Okay, and so could you explain these uh, to me? Okay, let's take the section subfraction first. Okay. So um, here we have um, a cartoon of some tissue. Maybe caudal is to the left and rostral is to the right. Sure. And for whatever reason, and we're going to talk a little bit about how you make these decisions, but for whatever reason, mm -hmm. uh, the person has decided to do a pilot study uh, using uh, taking every fifth section. Okay. So that's what we mean by systematic. 
because we're going to extrapolate later. We're going to multiply by five because we're only looking at every fifth section. Okay. So there's four sections that we're not actually sampling on. So we know the section subfraction is one fifth. Yeah. That means whatever number of cell tops we count, we're going to need to multiply by five. Okay. But we're also going to be random. You can't start on section one. And I'm, ca I'm calling section one where your region first appears. Okay. You can't start on section one for every animal. And so this is confusing to me because when I was first thinking about the study, I, I had this, this idea that it would be more even-handed of me if on every single animal in my control and in every single animal in my transgenic group, I always picked the first piece of tissue that my region of anatomy showed up in and then picked the same interval after that. You're telling me that I shouldn't do that. Yeah, that would be a good thought if you wanted to study only one-fifth of your region <laughs> and you wanted to study the same one-fifth of your region every time. Right, which is not what I'm interested in. I want an estimate of the cell numbers of the total region. We want to give every section an equal chance of being picked to be sampled uh, when we come to each animal. So the systematic aspect of this comes in that I pick the tissue interval. In this case, yes. we say every fifth. But the random aspect comes in that I have to randomize what that first piece of tissue is. We're going to have to pick a number out of a hat between one and five. Okay. Let's say we pick number three. Okay. So if I pick number three, then let's say that I'm working on control animal number one. I pick a random number between one and five, and I get three. I would start off with the third piece of tissue that came off my cryostat or vibratome, and then, as is shown here, I'd basically be analyzing only the purple columns. That's right. Now I get to control animal number two. I pick another random number between one and five, let's say two. It might even be three again. But it might yeah. even be three again, yep. but it's been randomized at yes. least. And then I pick only every, uh, every fifth one after that. That's right. We're given each section an equal chance of being sampled on. Okay. And what happens once you get the section and put it up on the microscope? Right. So let's assume that this is section number four. Okay. And I've put this up on my scope. And now um, I'm going to use Stereo Investigator and my motorized stage to lay down a grid of dissectors in my striatum. So the first thing you have to do is outline the striatum. Right. I outline my region of interest. This can actually be drawn um, loosely if mm -hmm. you want to. It doesn't matter if you end up with empty dissectors, um, except that will affect your efficiency if you okay. have a lot of empty dissectors. Okay. Um, so you draw the region of interest, and then you choose the spacing between the dissectors. Right, so let's say that I chose that I'm going to put a dissector every 100 microns by 100 microns in X and Y. And then it will make a random throw of where to start those dissectors. Okay, so here the, the pale blue, the small blue squares represent where the dissectors are at. Those are the ones with the red and green sides that we were looking at before. Where I actually count my cell tops in. Right. And the larger bluish greenish squares represent the systematic and random placement of these dissectors? Uh, well, the, um, the larger squares are the spacing between the dissectors. Okay. And um, the, the randomness comes in that when you get to the next section in this animal, it's going to be thrown down in a different way. Okay, I see. So it's systematic again, just like in the tissue sectioning. It's systematic in that the spacing of the dissector is set by the investigator. And that's going to let us extrapolate out. Yeah, but the actual placement, let's say, of that first one is done automatically by my software. So that we don't end up looking at the same part of the section on each section. And so even if I did, let's say that I did the same run on the same piece of tissue a couple times, I would not get identical placement of dissectors one after another, correct? New, um, usually you wouldn't do um, more than one run on a section, but to answer your theoretical question, yeah, if you did another run on the same section, you would get a different pattern, you would, uh, a random uh, placing of your dissectors. I see. So the sections were systematic random, the physical sections, e each section had an equal chance of being picked. Okay. After we get a starting point, we stay constant in our spacing. Okay. And once the section is up here, every point in our region of interest has an equal chance of being sampled on. Okay, all right, I think I, I follow you now. So let's uh, move on to the next step now. So I have my tissue, um, I've laid down a dissector, now I'm going to go yeah, in... I, you've laid down a grid so your dissectors can appear. Excellent. Yeah. Okay. And now I go in at high magnification and I focus up and down through my tissue. Um, 
Okay, so this is a side view. This is a side view of... Remember, this has to be a three-dimensional process, and we have to have thin Z-planes so we can focus up and down, mm -hmm. deciding whether the tops of these cells are in the dissector or not. So why don't... I? So I've, I've read that I shouldn't make my dissector height equal the total height of my tissue, and if I understand this correctly... It's, it's because be of artifact. It's because of artifact, right? Yes. So as the blade, as my, my sectioning tool sections the tissue, I can have cells that have been plucked out or I can have like the lost top of a cell, which if I'm counting cell tops, now I've artificially removed some of those cell we tops. We don't want to be sampling where it's not as, uh, as it should appear. We don't want to be sampling where there's artifact. Right, we want so, to sample the tissue the way it was as closely as we can as when it was in the brain intact. Sometimes a knife will actually compress a region on the top and the bottom and it'll be denser than it should be. Regardless, whatever kind of artifact it is, we need to have these guard zones. Okay. And the guard zones have to be big enough to cover up your artifact. And so when I plan my study uh, and I'm starting to think about my dissector height and my guard zone uh, height, I really have to consider the post-processing thickness of my tissue and have some empirical semi, a, a good idea of about how thin the thinnest part of my tissue is, yeah. Uh, that's right. The thinnest part of your tissue is going to restrict how tall you can make your dissector, mm -hmm. and so will the guard zones. Okay. So this is uh, what you call the height sampling fraction, correct? And it's the, that's the ratio between the thickness of the mounted tissue and the height of the dissector. That's right. It's the dissector height divided by the average mounted section thickness. Okay. So this is the HSF, or the height sampling fraction. And you've already talked to me about the area sampling fraction and the section sampling fraction. So how do these three come together? Okay, this is the math behind, behind how the estimate is made. Okay. Um, you can think, uh, the, the idea of this extrapolation is a pretty simple idea. Um, um, sometimes I give a simple example, like if you've ever been at a sporting event, Yeah. I don't know about you, but sometimes my mind wanders at sporting events and I, <laughs> try, to, I try to estimate how many people okay. are in the stadium. All right. And what do you do when you do that? You don't try to count every head in the stadium. No, no. Well, if, if the game is that boring, what I will do is um, I'll probably look at one section. Uh, generally, stadiums are broken into sections, so I'll try to count how many people there are in one section and then try to see how many sections there are. You're going to take a volume fraction and count how many people are in there. Let's say you sample one-tenth of the stadium mm -hmm. and you count ten people. Okay. How many people are in the whole stadium? Uh, a hundred people in this very small stadium. <laughs> so what you just did is, um, in your head, is you came up, you came up with the estimate, which is n, mm -hmm. by taking the volume fraction, mm -hmm. which I made up as one tenth, and you took the reciprocal of that. You 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 knew in your gut that you had to multiply by ten because there's nine Other. places where we did not look. I see. Right. And, and so you take the reciprocal of the volume fraction and you multiply it by how many heads you counted, or in our case, how many cell tops we've counted in all our dissectors in all our sections, okay. and that will give you an estimate of how many cells are in the whole region. And so here, the sigma Q minus is the, the total sum of all of those cell tops that I've counted. Right, the Q minus represents the unique point on the cell that we're counting. Okay, and so explain to me now, this, this volume fraction has um, those three components involved in it, correct? The so things we just went over, which is how many physical sections are you skipping? Okay. Take the reciprocal of that. Okay. Um, what is the ratio of the counting frame area to the space between the counting frames? Okay. Um, you take the reciprocal of that so we can stra extrapolate out in the XY plane. Okay. And then um, what we just looked at was the height of the dissector divided by the average mounted section thickness. Okay. So we're going to have to be met, uh, we're going to have to be measuring the thickness of the tissue. Yeah. So this brings up a good point: is is that one of the things I hear very often is, well, how often are you going to measure your tissue thickness? And here, this is a clear example that measuring my mounted section thickness actually has an effect on my estimate. I, I want to be more precise in my measurement of mounted thickness. I want to measure more often. I'm great at answering uh, theoretical questions. <laughs> okay. And, and, and so um, the answer to that is if your, if your thickness of your tissue doesn't vary at all, you only need to measure it once. Sure, but my tissue thickness will vary because... The more it varies, the more uh, measurements you should make. Okay, all right. That, that makes sense. Notice I think... how I avoided answering how many measurements. Quite deftly, <laughs> yes, indeed. So just to, to summarize for now, because I've, I've gotten quite a bit of information here now, uh, to summarize the use of the optical fractionator, 
what I want to do is I want to pick an unambiguous point to use as a quote unquote handle. That's going to let us count cells instead of cell pieces. Okay. I want to pay attention to the red and green planes of the dissector and follow those rules. That makes sure we only count things that belong in the volume fraction. Okay. Then I want to place the dissector in a systematic random grid throughout my tissue. Sections. That's the best way to sample. And I want to make sure that in, I mean, in order for me to count cell tops, I have to have several optic planes through the dissector and use guard zones to avoid tissue damage. If you can get 10 optical planes through your dissector, you're going to be in good shape. And so when I use these rules, what I've done here is, is or I should say, the purpose of following these rules are to help avoiding bias. That's right. And so this question of, of how to sample and, and how to best make your sampling scheme is, is something that uh, I've spent quite a bit of time thinking about in the context of thinking, okay, fine, well, Dan, I follow all these rules, I go through and I create my estimate following these rules to avoid bias, but now I have this estimate. What do I do with this estimate? How do I, how do I gauge whether or not this estimate is meaningful to me or not? Okay, so we're going to kind of switch gears uh, in the talk a little bit. We've been talking about rules to follow, uh, use the top of the cell, honor the red and green plane, yes. have many optical planes, use guard zones, use systematic random sampling. If you follow all those rules, it will eliminate bias and you'll get an unbiased estimate. Okay. So let's use this symbol of the uh, target uh, to talk about this a little bit. Sure. Um, and the true numbers at the bullseye, uh, we may not even know the true number or never know the true right. number. Right, I have no a priori knowledge as to what the actual true cell number and is. And may never know it. May um, never know it. But what we're trying to do is come up with an estimate that suits our needs. Okay. So um, if we, uh, I'm going to put some arrows, some dots <laughs> on this target. And each one of these uh, yellowish brown dots represents an animal that I've analyzed. That's right, an animal that we've done the optical fractionator on and we've come up with an estimate. Okay, so that looks that looks pretty good, right? I'm, I'm right around there. That is an unbiased estimate because it's mean. If you draw a vector, you'll be on the true number. Okay. So whoever did this study managed to follow all the rules we're talking about. Even though any one animal's estimate may be a little bit far away from the true number, sure. if, you're, if you're eliminating bias, the mean will be on the true number and you have an unbiased estimate. Okay. Now here's an example of high precision but there is bias. So whoever did this study was not able to follow the rules correctly. And this appears to be a, a systematic bias so that every animal in the group had kind of the same bias applied and this is probably an example of somebody who said well um, I'm going to count cells even if they show up in the crossing the red lines and then did that systematically throughout the entire study. It seems study. like they were um, consistent with their errors. Well, so they're being very given. precise here. Yes. But it's not doing them any good to be precise because they're making mistakes and ha coming up with a biased um, um, estimate mm -hmm. of the number of cells. So you've been systematic, but you've also been, bi you've been biased and, you're, and that doesn't really help you because the estimates now are actually farther away from the true number than is useful for me. So in this last example here with the green dots. Yeah, this that's is what I want, right? Well, not necessarily. Okay. You do, uh, you always want to be unbiased. Yes. So you always want to be in a situation like the green dots or the yellow dots. Okay. But you don't want to be doing too much work. So in other words, sometimes the situation with the yellow dots, yeah. which are equally unbiased as the green dots, but are less precise. Okay. In other words, they've done less sampling. They had their dissectors farther apart, or they skipped more sections. Mm -hmm. They fall on the peaks and the valleys of the data more. Okay. And um, they're not as precise. But there's some questions you need to ask yourself about, can I get away with using this yellow, less precise situation? I see. Because we don't want to be too precise. I mean, a lot of labs will think about, I need to be precise enough so that when at the end, if I have five animals in experiment, mm -hmm. five in the control group, and I do a t-test. Yeah. Well, number one, if that t-test is significant, you're good. Yeah. You've sampled properly. Right. I've been able to actually determine a difference between my groups. But what you may be wondering about is if the t-test is not significant, you have to ask yourself, is, is the reason for that because I was not precise enough in my sampling? So I need to really think about the amount of work that I want to do 
for my ends. And, and most labs have this idea down that they need to do enough work so that they can the differences will come out. But yeah. we also really want to think about not doing too much work. Sure, I don't so want to be here for the rest of my life doing this study. We don't want to change a three-month experiment into a nine-month experiment no, when it could have been done um, with less of a precision level but still have that t-test. So how do, right. I, how do I make these decisions? What do, how do I make my decisions towards figuring out my level of precision? Well, this is kind of a chicken chicken and the egg, which came first thing, but if you know something about what type of effect you expect. Okay. If you, you think your experimental cell number is going to be close to your control cell number, then you would have to do more sampling to make that difference come out. Okay. If, you, if you're expecting a large difference, then you can do less sampling and to get the same um, uh, to to make the same difference come out. And I understand from my reading now that one of the major questions that I, you should I should use in taking this into consideration are whether or not the objects that I'm interested in counting normally or her homogeneously distributed in my region of yeah, interest. Go, go back to that example I gave about the sporting stadium. Yeah. Um, we said we counted ten people in one tenth of the stadium. Yeah. Well, what what could mess that estimate up? Uh, well, I could be looking at that one area where the cheap seats are at that everybody went and bought at and there's just aren't many seats. that's right or so you've got nine other volume compartments that you didn't look at people mm -hmm. may be up getting refreshments you, you don't know that there are 10 people in each no compartment and that's what we're talking about with the second point here if your particles are evenly spread out like on the left here where i have a very homogeneous uh, population of cells. Yeah, the distance between the cells is going to be similar mm -hmm. uh, between each cell, whereas on the right um, we have clumping going on. We have more of a heterogeneous distribution. So which one of those do you think you're going to get more of a clear um, picture of from putting these four dissectors down? Well, I, I clearly it's going to be the one on the left because the cells are just distributed more evenly. That's right. And the on the right is where I have this this um, situation that you tried to explain with a with a stadium that you know in some of the sections or in some of the counting frames that I look at, the cells are are much more sparsely uh, arranged, and in some other locations they're very densely clumped. That's right. So and and so it's not so much whether the overall cell the pattern is sparse or dense. It's are you seeing variability in your counting sites? Okay, but here it's very easy for me to look at these two and compare it, but in reality, I might not have that left-hand experiment uh, or data to look at. I only have what I'm looking at the right, okay? So I've done this study and I've put down my dissectors and without me really knowing this yet, it turns out that the cells are too clumped up and my, my dissectors are not appropriately laid out. How do I what what do I how do I know this? What do, how do I gauge this? I, I told you I only answered theoretical oh, here questions. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Okay. There are formulas that have been invented. Uh, this is not your um, classical deviation from the mean C V. You're talking about these coefficient of errors. Uh, C E, I mean. Yeah. yeah. Um, th these are formulas that have been invented to try to let you know something about your precision level. Okay. Um, and most of these coefficients of error, and we have listed on the bottom the Gunderson CE, for okay. instance, um, most of these CEs try to gauge whether your cell counts are variable from either dissector to dissector or section to section. Okay, that's a very nice theoretical. How mm -hmm. do I use that, though? So let's assume mm -hmm. that I get my estimate, and there's some value, cell numbers equals X. And then I look at my Gunderson coefficient of error, and it has some value. How do I use that value in the context of well, looking at Well, for instance, the Gunderson CE is set up to look at three sections in a row and look at how the um, number of cell tops that you counted for the whole section varies okay. uh, among those three sections. And it, it will ripple through the, um, the sections, comparing three sections. Mm -hmm. And the, the way it's set up is if you get a similar number of cell tops counted for each section, it will drive the CE low. Okay, it's lower value. So a lower CE is better. Okay. Um, this, so, yes. so, okay, let me see if I just understand this. So I get my estimate, I look at my Gunderson CE, and the way I interpret it is that, okay, if my CE is very high, that means that my cell distribution is quite heterogeneous, and that I should probably go through and change my sampling scheme to adjust to this heterogeneous cell population. And what you'd specifically do is put more dissectors in there or, or, or take more sections. So Okay, so when you say take more sections, you're talking about uh, a situation where 
for example, if I'm counting BRDU label cells in the dentate gyrus, and I have such a small number on each of my tissue sections, my Gunderson CE is high, I keep adding dissectors. But let's say I get to the point where I've now added dissectors that are just totally exhaustively sampling my tissue section. The only option I have left is just to add more tissue sections. That's right. And um, you may actually have to put your counting frames and dissectors right next to each other. Mm -hmm. For instance, if the cells are very clumped, or if there's only, say, 50 or 100 cells in the whole system, sure. you have to find those cells. Yeah. Um, but the CE is a tool, is a good tool that can be used, and the lower the CE is, um, the better of a job you've done with sampling. So I use the CE to measure or to gauge my sampling scheme and its appropriateness for my cell distribution. That's right. Excellent. Okay, um, Dan. There's some more practical advice. Oh, um, wow, nice. I'm here. So we do get this question a lot, and the question is, how many sections should I take yeah. and how close together or far apart should I put my yeah, dissectors? Yeah, exactly. And there's three things we can think of that can help people. One is um, search the literature. Okay. For instance, if you're um, looking at newly born uh, BRDU cells and the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, yep. everyone and their sister is doing that. <laughs> my sister's doing that right now, actually. <laughs> I, can, uh, I can point you to papers that we, I trust and uh -huh. I think we can read them together and if you trust them, you know, by all means, that's a good place to start yeah. your um, pilot study from. Yeah. Um, you really have to be the expert in your tissue. You need to realize the salient features. Yeah. For instance, if you're deciding how close together to space your dissectors, if there's a clump of cells in there that you never want to miss, mm -hmm. Uh, don't place them far apart enough where you would ever miss that. Okay, that makes sense. Um, sure. You may have a mentor who's been, he or she has been sectioning the tissue the same way for decades. You know, mm -hmm. talk to him or her about why they're doing it, and this may be a very good place to start your pilot study. And you mentioned earlier, um, before the webinar, you mentioned this oversample and resample option. Okay, so this is, um, if you really want, are new to the region or you really want to get some help, Mm -hmm. with deciding whether your spacing of your dissectors and how many sections you take is going to give you the precision you need to make the difference come out between the two groups. Um, this is a, a great pep paper that I recommend to read. I, I would love to read this paper with anyone and we can go over it. <laughs> nice. Um, and this lays out a way, and this is in... Um, this is in our program stereo investigator now. Okay. And this is a method to oversample the tissue and then back off on the sampling and ask would there be enough precision um, with less work I see. to make your differences. So you're out. basically giving the software, in Stereo Investigator at least, you'd be giving the software more data than you probably would give in your normal study or That's count right. more cells than you normally would count and then have the software kind of parse that out and say, okay, well, here's what happens when I drop every nth tissue section. That's right. Get an idea for precision. Okay, so let's assume that I'm not going to do the oversample resample. Let's assume that I do have some kind of guidance, and then I want to run a pilot study. Okay. Um, you, you need to come up with a starting point. Yeah. Uh, you can take what you think is a typical section, and you can come up with a spacing that maybe gives you 10 dissectors on there. Mm -hmm. Or you could take all your sections and r uh, run a quick uh, estimation of the area on all the sections, and mm -hmm. then come up with a spacing that maybe gives you 100 spaces throughout the whole animal. Sure. Um, if you didn't do the oversampling and resampling to come up with kind of a yeah. sweet spot yeah. where you're taking enough sections so you get good precision, but you're not doing so many sections that you have ridiculously sure. high precision. So kind of like wasting time. With, within yeah. reason, count probably more cells than I think I should count, and then evaluate. Is that what you're saying? Um, you never want to count more cells than needed. Okay. So, um, but. If you're doing the oversampling and resampling, then that's a technique where you count more cells than you think you're going to do and then back off on it. Okay. Um, but you really do want to have a balance of enough dissectors and sections so you get the precision you need mm -hmm. to um, make the difference come out, if there is a difference. Yes. But not so many that you are using overkill and wasting months of the most valuable resource in the lab. Right, excellent. Well, Dan, you know, we're, we're running short on time here and you've given me quite a bit of advice here to, to get going. So um, why don't we close out by saying that um, with the tools given here, we can probably have a pretty good idea 
of where to get started in thinking of our stereological study. Um, there's also several other resources that, that I know I can look at and our audience can look at. Uh, one of them is uh, www.stereology.info, and these are some of the books that you recommended to me to take a look at uh, earlier today. Yes. Um, after the webinar, uh, for those of you in the audience who wish to do some more reading on stereology, visit stereology.info. Um, you can also contact mbflabs.com for contract stereology work, as well as some uh, pilot studies that can be done for you. Uh, we recommend these two stereology workshops, uh, Dr. Dan Peterson's uh, workshop on stereology, which you can look for more information on at neurorenew.com, as well as Dr. Mark West's course, uh, which you can get more information on on neurostereology.com. Uh, again, please feel free to email us questions uh, at info at mbfbioscience.com if you didn't get a chance to submit a question during the webinar. Uh, if you did submit a question, as we mentioned previously, and we did not answer it during the webinar, rest assured we will get to it uh, shortly after the conclusion of the presentation. And if you still would like more information or want to see any of our other webinars, uh, check out our YouTube, ta uh, YouTube channel to get some more videos for quick stereology help. So with that, we'd like to conclude our presentation. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, it's been my pleasure and Dan's as well. Thanks, Jose. That was fun. Thank you, Dan, from both of us and all of us here at MBF. Thank you for joining us and have a pleasant day.